think you just All right, give right. crayons to a child. And have okay. Coloring. Welcome to the commentary for Last Man on Earth, starring Vincent Price. Uh, Rob Lee and this is Biff Burles is going to give you a commentary on this movie. Um, just like the book, this has a slow pace. And probably if you want to know philosophically worldview of Richard Matheson, this is the movie or the book you want to read about. This is the closest adaptation of the book. And the f uh, film was uh, directed by um, Italian director... Uh, Sidney Salgaco, and the script was written in part by Madison, but he was dissatisfied with the result and chose to be credited as Logan Swanson. As we see here, we get the introduction. This is a Richard Matheson introduction. And understand what's the difference between a Richard Matheson introduction versus, uh, say, a Ray Bradbury introduction is they followed an outline. Uh, he was, okay, let's get people's attention. Why even sit there and bother with uh, uh, boring you to death with details. <laughs> we'll get to there as the action starts. And I think this was a brilliant way of writing. And I think this is the reason why he's very important in the writing. I wish more writers would study his uh, form of writing. Now we see uh, a uh, shot of Vincent Price. Vincent Price, of course, was known for his macabre horror this is, was one of his favorite films, and I can see why, because it put him to the limits of testing. For someone to do a role such as uh, Last Man on Earth, you have to be able to carry the uh, movie. And in all three adaptations of the book, I agree with all their casting choices, from Vincent Price to Charlton Heston to Will Smith, because of the fact that Will Smith was uh, could carry a, an, a solo act together. Someone like Robin Williams... Would obviously would be a good choice in my opinion if today for uh, this importantly, but he has passed away at this time. But someone who could carry a scene by themselves, and that's what Vincent Price, who was a theatrics um, educated. Uh, it's interesting that you should yeah. say something about carrying. Yeah. Uh, later on, we'll see him carrying bodies. Right. Uh, he <laughs> wanted to use actual humans uh, when he was putting them in the vehicle. Now, obviously, he couldn't throw them in the pit, which you'll see later, but he wanted, he actually used actual human beings because he wanted to show what it would like, be like for a human being to carry another human being into his vehicle. Um, so that was one thing. Um, something you was talking about, the, the person that actually made this movie, uh, or the, the director, uh, originally... Um, uh, one of the persons looked at for directing this was Fritz Lang. Uh, Fritz Lang, who yeah, that's is correct. famous and for that Metropolis. That is the reason why Vincent Price was so hardly to get on board with the uh, project, because when he heard that, and I think everybody was well, another thing was, excited about what was going He was on. Uh, very heavily associated with Hammer, and Hammer was also slated to be involved in yeah. this. I, and I apologize, I made a mistake of this is Ubato Ragana who did this, and he was an Italian uh, director. Well, that was, yeah, that was the thing. After uh, and, um, Fritz Sidney Lang was no... Salco as well worked no on longer, it. He, he was part of the screenwriting process along with uh, uh, Richard Matheson and U Ubato Ragana. But what has ha what happened with the film is it, it was ended up being in Italy, and it kind of really what hurt it's um yeah, it was almost if there had been a genre it would have been uh, spaghetti uh, uh spaghetti zombie spaghetti horror or uh, well uh, i say spaghetti zombie because there is a lot of spaghetti zombie but uh, what has happened well, here because of this would film, have invented it. <laughs> we we get night of the living dead because yeah. they really like the the zombies as we come for and like he said the caring this is the first scene that we'll see here and we'll watch Vincent Price decide to pick up the female because she's lighter than the male. But <laughs> well, actually, if you see most both of these, both of these dang dead are bodies right in the way again. Very light human beings. Yeah. This man, obviously, very or is that a woman? Oh no, the woman's over there. He decides okay. to pick okay. up the woman. But anyhow, <laughs> it's a very light man if you see. But still, there you know, she is. Yeah. yeah. 
And it's like, she's light, I'll take her. <laughs> well, that was that was the thing, too. This actually, I mean, this movie, uh, even though it these are not zombies. These are always called vampires, vampires in this. Yeah. Uh, but if you follow the way these quote-unquote vampires move, they actually established the way that future zombies would act. Because... Before this, zombies were always mindless, basically humanoid machines. And they only followed the orders of those that controlled them. Right. Like Bob Hope said, they were like Democrats. Well, yeah. Yeah. They're like Democrats. Um, but uh, because of this movie, uh, Romero, you know, created the modern zombie. Because he saw these as even having potential for thought. Now, Romero's zombies uh, in, in Night of the Living Dead did not talk. But these zombies did, or quote-unquote vampires did. And uh, you'll see that as being very important to the plot. Right. And and uh, going back to our director here, Ubato Regana only had one theatrical release after this and this was the sweet smell of love which came afterward in 1966 but our other screenwriter sydney salco he he did more than 50 uh, motion pictures as a screen screenwriter he was an american and he returned to uh, uh, new york city uh, during world war ii and was commissioned to the united states marine corps and he rose to the rank of major so, uh, but the what his career after this would include uh, Lassie as a TV director, the Cisco Kid, and of course the Adams Family. And he retired from directing in 1959 and went to teaching film courses at the University of Northridge, where he became a professor and headed the film side of the radio, television, and film department. And as again, this establishes uh, what we're what we're going on. And Richard Matheson. As I said, uh, well, he's, he doesn't sit there and start out showing the horror. The flashbacks will come and we'll explain why uh, this is all going on. And, and like I said, we, we have vampires here, uh, but George Romero saw them more as zombies, just anything that was uh, flesh-eating and undesirable. Um, what Richard Matheson did when he wrote the I Am Legend book was he wanted to take anything supernatural from vampires and make them scientific. And yeah, that that's, was the idea. That's true because the uh, the uh, vampires are noted in here as being allergic to, to garlic, garlic yeah. and hating their image in the mirror. Right. Whereas before a vampire, there was a supernatural reason. You know, right. it's, it had something to do. Even the um, the Religious symbols in the book, uh, I understand that if the, uh, yeah, the vampire was, had been a a right. uh, Jew, he would the cross would do nothing for him. Right, it would the Star of David would do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, th and that and that was uh, his idea. I think what the idea is is to. I think uh, is to take away from the magic and Hollywood uh, obstruction of uh, the the, uh, the religious side because uh, Hollywood does kind of destroy and then and really you know not say, take anything away from Ten Commandments or any movies like that but they kind of distort what really what the Bible is especially if you're more thinking Christian versus a uh, a physical. Uh, a Christian, you know, uh, someone who's based on uh, emotional, you know, uh, that's the reason why Reformed people have a hard time adjusting to the, uh, you know, the charismatic movement and things like that. And I think that's where Richard Matheson saw too. And I don't, I, I have a feeling that he is a religious person, and uh, but he sees it well, as more be, like a Reform. Well, you'd be than surprised a, at how many yeah. science fiction and fantasy writers. Right. were uh, of a certain faith because yeah. of uh well it takes faith to to uh to believe in something like this oh yeah uh, exactly you know because and i'll take the light one because yeah. the man is just too heavy <laughs> um but well uh, another thing is is about uh this what we're seeing here is a typical day for him 
every day he would get up, he oh, would he drink his coffee, he would uh, uh, cut some uh, 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 steaks out, he would collect whatever bodies were on his lawn, he'd make sure he had plenty of fuel, uh, all these things. And, and it was just a, it was a monotonous time at this. I mean, after three years of doing this, we see him starting to break down. I mean, this is really, that's another thing I like about Vincent Price in this. He does not just the whole dialogue with himself, but he also does madness very well. Somebody that doesn't do madness would not be very, because he, he is, this is basically driving him mad. Um, the, uh, result of someone say living on a desert island for years, it would drive them mad, or it would either it would either do that, or would uh, have them lose certain social skills. Like for instance, they they have known people that have been deserted on an island, not being able to properly speak to people after and, they come back, right, and start hotel, come back and start hotels, and then have the Harlem Gove Charters visit them. Yeah. I love this burn pit scene here, right here. Yeah, this is, well, I mean... And I think that a lot of this is, uh, if you have a little bit of uh, military background, a lot of, that, I, especially in World War II, and Salco was a World War II veteran, he probably saw a lot of this. As you see, uh, he's putting on the gas mask. And it makes me think, too, if the uh, that the disease was airborne, too. I wonder, too, if they're, they're trying to convey that message. Did you kind of see that, too, when he, see, he puts the gas well, mask yeah. on? Well, yeah. Well, the gas mask is for the smell. Right, exactly. And um, I mean, it's, But I'm it's saying, terrible. too, that, that uh, maybe also to not just him, but the other. And uh, Well, he's, he's got an aversion to it. Yeah. Um, it is explained in the film that he got it from uh, being bit by a bat, right. and uh, he thinks that's why he's he's uh, immune. Uh, but one of the things that got me when I was watching this scene here is why was he driving a um a, a, why was he driving a a a wagon and not why didn't he take one of these trucks? Put a whole lot more dead bodies in that truck. I, I think trying to avoid reality. <laughs> Maybe I don't know because I, mean, I, I don't. Of he, course, he, I don't know because he, film, he ends up shopping for another station wagon later. Well, he has to, yeah. and and like I said, I think it's um, he's trying to hold on to his past and hold on to and uh, accept the future as well. So he's halfway there, and I think three years, like you're saying, is. I think he f experiences what we would call burnout, and I think that's what Richard Matheson was probably going through. He's probably saying, how long would it take for me if I was isolated to finally reach to the breaking point? And I think he said, well, three years would do it. And I think back in those days, because of the technology that isn't available now, I think in those days, yeah, people probably would have held out longer than they do now. Nowadays, I can't imagine going th two or three days without the internet or a week without this and that. Uh, it would be hard to adjust to for a lot of people. They would have such horrible withdrawals. Uh, I think but during this time, and of course, like you said, you're just coming out of World War II. They're 20 years away from World War II. A lot of this stuff they probably witness. Uh, a lot of the post-apocalyptic type things in Europe, especially in Italy at this time. And so they kind of knew what a post-apocalyptic world would look at, you know, looking at Paris and Rome. And as we see him going into the meat cooler right here. Three-year-old meat. <laughs> looking for some garlic. Oh, that smells good. That's perfect. <laughs> Of course, the producer of this is Robert Lippert. He became fascinated by the cinema at an early age, and as a youngster, he worked on a variety of jobs in local theaters. Lippert encouraged regular attendance with promotions such as Dish Night and Book Night. Lippert went from cinema manager to owning a chain of cinemas in California in 1942 during the peak years of theater attendance. Lippert's theaters in Los Angeles often screen older films for continuous 24 hours with a mission price of 25 cents 
Not only did this theater subtract shift workers and late night re- revelers, but servicemen on leave who could not find cheap accommodations who would sleep in the cinema. Lippert died on November 16, 1976, and he has cremated remains were entered at the Woodlawn Memorial Park. And, of course, that's in uh, California as well. Mm -hmm. And this is an American international release. And what do we know about American international release? Uh, We get into, um, uh, of course, uh, the same two people who would be involved with uh, the uh, Roger Corman, Edgar Allan Poe. So this pre-dawns that. And we have later he will be playing in Raven and these uh, big to do uh, colorized horror uh, adaptations of Edgar Allan Poe's uh, short stories and poems, and which b- people today probably see two or uh, two or three of them as probably some of the greatest horror that was ever made. And these were Roger Corman. Uh, directed and was released by the same people who released this film, American International. Well, there's your uh, montage. There's there's a uh, segue for me. Thank you. Yeah. (laughs) Um, A lot of people would think, well, okay, he did this, did this film, Last Man on Earth. And being that Roger Corman is a uh, great imitator of other films, we would think, well, a few years later, he made Last Woman on Earth. Not so. Last Woman on Earth actually predates this movie. Right. Um, which, if you watch it, though, it really has nothing... I'm not saying nothing to do, because they're both... They both are post-apocalyptic films. But they're uh, also... Uh, but Corman went a different direction with Last Woman on Earth. His was actually almost going along the lines of um, the survival of, of the race. This doesn't do that. This film really isn't about a survival of a race, but more of a survival of a man. Because he is literally, he is literally the last man on earth. If you'll, after you watch this movie, you'll know that this is literally what this is about. Uh, it's a man staying alive. Is is there some hope that there's others like him? Sure. I mean, I'm sure in his mind to this whole thing, there's oh, there's got to be more like me. Uh, but it's like I said, it's it's that survival of one man that this movie really pivots on. Uh, there's no like like I said, there's no dialogue through most of this movie with anybody else. I mean, people or characters come up later, but it's. It's, you know, it's a very different thing. Um, but there are... Corman, though, on the other hand, with his film, uh, he actually had other movies that he fed off of. This movie, again, doesn't do that. Uh, this movie is very, very unique. Uh, people think, well, there's lots of zombie-type movies like this. I mean, this, this scene right here... If somebody told me it was from Night of the Living Dead, I would believe them, except for when this man starts talking. Uh, Because it looks very much like Night of the Living Dead. But other post-apocalyptic films before this were not in that vein. They were more about the survival of the race, what it would take to make, uh, uh, to keep humans alive well that's the thing with this film is uh as we're seeing this is his night uh time routine now as mm-hmm. we see that like we have this uh, is that a compressor or a generator in the room there yes he's got a generator yes so. i'm trying to uh keep everything going and dealing with this at night uh one of his friends is of course we'll find out later is out there uh, asking for him and mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's how they know his name, and uh, which is which is interesting. We'll find out later about that. But uh, one thing I, I think, as as we see another a flashback to try to give us a, and that was something that uh, the I Am Legend two thousand and seven 
uh, did was a lot of flashbacks to slowly uh, feed what was uh, coming to the post the apocalyptic world. I the um, Charlton Heston was uh, film version seemed like it was more of an airborne disease. Uh, the tooth. You know, the 2007 version had, uh, you know, it was more of a plague-like disease that uh, we couldn't uh, fight. Um, so a lot of a lot of different adaptations of what it was. Uh, Richard Matheson, I, I think his was more or less, you know, trying to tell his story of I Am Legend, considering the fact that that the human race could be legendary, that anything could be legendary, because he begins to be the, um, as you would say, the Bigfoot to the, the other side, because he, you know, he's the, you know, whereas vampires were legends, he becomes the legend of the for the vampires, you know, that they talk about him, and that's the reason why I think that's the reason why if you like Charlton Heston's version, uh, they're more talking and. And it's more occult like <laughs> than 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 this one. This one's less about cultic type sex. And I think uh, uh, you know, I guess because the Manson family and all that stuff was going on in the news during during those days when that was released, a lot of that wasn't a big deal during this time. I I, I think that's the reason why this film is kind of underappreciated for that. But as we know, this film was uh, was uh, filmed in Italy. And then it was dubbed back over here in English and really hurt the film as far as sound-wise. Uh, the soundtrack was criticized. The dubbing was criticized as being subpar. The pacing of the film is uh, is very slow, but again, that's what Richard Matheson really wants because his book is real slow in pacing, and I think because he's dealing with a serious subject matter that he feels kind of compassionate about. Uh, well, they... What we're seeing here is a scene that is out of the norm. Right. And it may be something he did occasionally, and, and, and I would think that he probably did it occasionally. Right. To connect with this humanity, because that's the remains of his, his wife. Right. And so he comes here to mourn. Uh you know, to take a break from everything he's involved in. And this, and this is also a very pivotal scene because uh, his because of his stopping from his his task, he, he could have very well have lost his, his life here, as you'll see. You can see the candles burned down. And I and I think, like I say, it shows the humanity of the character, yeah. like you're saying. And I I think anybody in a normal situation like this would do the do the same thing. They would uh, go, uh, you know, you 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 miss someone very much. You would uh, pay well, that's, uh, that, homage that's the to end them. of yeah. That's the end of his humanity, right? Um, you know, now he's and here he's got to deal with this. Fans, get away from me. <laughs> um, Vincent, uh, and this, you know, you see the horror on his face, but now he has to kind yeah. of abandon some. He's, he's, he's goofed up here. He's really messed up. And uh, like I said, this could have cost him his life. Um. Because all these vampires are very slow. And in the book, that was another thing. In the book, the vampires were normal, what we think of vampires. They climbed walls. They had uh, thoughts. They had. They weren't just mindlessly walking around trying to get rid of the legend. The, in this, though, they're slowed down and made more like, like I said, like, Corman's yeah. zombies, and it could be like a European thing of what they feel about vampires as well versus uh, the American version mm. of what we think about vampires. And what amazes me is like if you take the 
uh, I'm just glad they're not the Japanese or the Oriental vampires <laughs> hopping around. Yeah, that would really make it worse. <laughs> well, it, it would it would not have brushed with any of the things. I, I, I think, think that the thing is is about this yeah. is that it did it did start the whole zombie trend. Right. I mean, what what we're thinking about mm-hmm. now, anything, uh, The Walking Dead, any zombie thing that's popular right now hinges. From this very movie, yeah, I mean, and, you, you know, if have anybody zombies can, until this, yeah, I this mean, until along. then, zombies, like I said, were just they they were more of what people uh, had traditionally experienced with the possession of dead bodies. Uh, you know, there's and there's other other things that were attributed to that as well, but they were not these creatures that could do anything on their own. Uh, they God pretty much had right to have someone that. tell them what to do. Um, uh, getting back though, to some car- comparison here, um, right here, we're seeing him, uh, him, uh, going further into some memories. Uh, but another thing about some of the comparison films, uh, especially taking the ones that Corman probably was, uh, uh, the direction that he went. Uh, there's two movies that I would mention that I would recommend you to watch. Uh, and I enjoyed both of them. Uh, one of them is called five. And this was, this one was, uh, released several years before, uh, this movie. Well, before, well, even before the Corman movie. And, uh, it is basically about five people that survive. And uh, showing uh, a very different sort of take on the uh, 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 the uh, survival of, of the race. Uh, the big thing is, of course, a lot of your post-apocalyptic films, and this one is 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 no different on that uh, five. Uh, it goes with the uh, the radiation thing, and so when when what five does is it shows a fear of going back to where radiation would be into the city. Right. Whereas, uh, other films would go in with it. It's just radiation is everywhere. Um, uh, another one, uh, would of course be the world, the flesh and the devil. Now the world, the flesh and the devil, the thing about it was, is that it wasn't so much, a radiation thing. The, it was a thing that lasted for five days. And a man was trapped underground in a mine for five days. So when he got out, all this had happened. It was like a uh, some kind of dusting that had, had destroyed the world uh, or destroyed the human, humans. And so when the world, the flesh, and the devil... What it has to do with is it has to do with a it, well, it's 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 a lot like uh, uh, Corman's Last Woman on Earth. Yeah. There's three people, two men, one woman, and uh, I, I would say that Corman probably ripped that one off because it's a very Hollywood film. Five is not five is. You can tell that it's there's nobody in it that you know. <laughs> it's all you know, but it's a good it's a good <clears throat> film for its time. Um, and then, of course, the other Hollywood film that was along this line again went with the radiation thing was on the beach. This one takes the whole if we destroyed all bombs and all that sort of stuff, uh, we'd be all right. Thing that that we yeah. did this to ourselves. And none of these other films do that. Well, we're talking as we're looking at the the really first major flashback here, we get more idea of a relationship between one of the vampires and well, future yes. vampires and uh, of course Neville. I of course the name is changed in this from the I Am Legend. The I Am Legend, of course, uh hero is robert neville or anti-hero i guess we could say more or less robert neville of course they say the vampirism 
is uh, symptoms are res- uh, resemble. It said that the pandemic was caused by war and that was spread by dust storms in the cities and explosion in the um, population. Uh, and of course, the narrative details of day life is as he attempts to comprehend, research, and possibly cure the disease, which is he is immune to. Of course, Neville's past is revealed through the flashbacks and the, of the and the disease. Of course, the disease ends up claiming the wife here. But uh, understanding this, and I guess this is to give him sort of a guilt complex right here because uh, he doesn't really accept the fact that there's. Uh, some sort of worldwide disease going on here. It's understandable. Yeah, because it's because it's not. It's not that it's understandable that he doesn't believe that this could happen, but it's the conditions that his friend will bring to it. Once he starts talking about what happens to people, he's really very skeptical beyond the fact of even wanting to do anything about it. Um, and of course, she's talking about the virus well, being until airborne it, until it really hits his family, and then it's really too late at that point. Yes, and and that's what I said. I I wonder if this is giving a little bit more harder, a uh, little something to live with, which yes. is really tough to live with, knowing that you might be at fault here. Um, the Samuel Zarkov, of course, the we know him from. Uh, um. You know, uh, we know him from the American International release, which released tons of Corman films, and later on, even cheaper films than Corman films, which you can imagine. He's known for biker flicks. He's known for all kinds of the flicks that came from American International. He, of course, uh, he was born into a Russian family. Arkoff was. He produced eighteen f- films in the fifties. Uh, you know, of course. Um, American International Pictures starred many established actors and principal at Cameo Rose, later became a household name. Um, of course, the like I said, he's not, they were known for the Edgar Allan Poe series, which will include Vincent Price as well. So, But there is also an Italian connection to, uh, to that as well, because one of the actors who was working over Italy came up with the idea for... This, according to what I've been told, you know, there's a lot of people who might dispute that. And then, of course, we get the Edgar Allan Poe series, which is Roger Corman did a, a beautiful job. And it's hard to believe that this is the same guy who goes independent in the 70s uh, with films with the, dealing with racing and, and Death Race 2000, movies like that. Uh, because you, you see something so different with the red mask and, and uh, of course, the pit and the pendulum and all these films that were vibrant, very epic-like and so artistic and uh, surreal in some cases, uh, sort of nightmare dream effects, were just wonderful films. And uh, this was from the same guy who directed... <laughs> you know a death race 2000 <laughs> yeah. well <laughs> it's hard i to mean believe, yeah. in his defense yeah. i mean uh, the, uh, taking for instance the last woman on earth right uh it's i think it's a very entertaining film yeah uh i mean it's not it doesn't move as as fast as some movies but in in the the aspect of it being entertaining it is uh, it has a, I mean, it has a very dramatic effect right. compared to this. This, if you're a horror lover, I do not recommend you to watch Last Woman on Earth. But if you like a good drama where you're you're just wanting to see the the uh, three characters try and figure out what they're going to do now. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's the end of the world. They're the last people on Earth. What are they going to do now? Um it doesn't take this turn because there's no there's no zombies or vampires or monsters running around. Uh, it's just three people saying, you know what? I've got the, we've got the entire world, As but it, there's uh, only one woman, right? And we're seeing in and this is the, this is sadness being piled upon sadness, mm-hmm. and and we get an idea why this guy is so depressed or why he's beaten down so bad because he's beaten down emotionally he's beaten down physically you lose your daughter you lose your wife you just you cannot 
a uh, fathom the depression that this guy had to go through and uh, of course i i believe what if i'm not correct that uh, we uh, i think richard Matson wanted to put in the fact that he was an alcoholic by this time as well and things like that and you can see why he was pushed into that direction and a lot of the way the world is on his shoulders as he's into his lab and with his friend here of course his friends uh kind of makes a jab and attack of his research of of not paying too much attention to the virus as we see here but he's really fighting it now that his wife and his child are both deadly sick or we'll say close to the vampirism uh, disease, which, uh, you know, Richard Matheson <coughs> created, and I, which is the first of its kind, because later on, many movies, many, 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 many movies will go on to try to go with the scientific version of the vampires, still the supernatural uh, view of vampires. And uh, I, I, I never noticed the double-breasted lab coats. You yeah. Know. And and this Doctor guy right here, have uh, breasted lab coats. I don't know if I, I got much on the the actor here who played um, our our uh, friend of of Morgan. Or like I said, his name is Morgan. This versus uh, uh, the, the name that we have from the I Am Legend um, novels, which was Neville Neville and. And of course, he in he's forced in the book. We he's forced to kill his wife, and as she seemingly rises rises from the dead as the vampire and attack him. And of course, Neville survives with barricading himself by sunset inside his house. Further produced by garlic, protected by garlic and mirrors. Uh, swarms of vampires led by Neville's neighbor is Ben Cortman, regularly surrounding his house, trying to find a way to that's get inside. His, that's that's his friend, right. Ben. And after three years, we see that Neville sees an apparently unaffected woman, and we'll get into that later. Um, well, this is this right here is where where we see the two sides. Right. Ben takes one side, and and uh, Morgan takes the other, and they're trying to you know they're trying to deal with this. And look at him; he's he, even his his expression shows the skepticism. Okay, I'll make you happy. And there's that bad dubbing, of course, we were talking about earlier. <laughs> this, uh, this apparently, it really hurt the pacing of the film, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of other things as well made the quality of the film because the film wasn't bad quality, as it was pretty contemporary with that, that day, but. It just didn't have the effect, especially from an actor at the time who films like House on the Haunted Hill and and films like that, which were very popcornish at the time. Uh, and I think that's the reason why this is became one of Vincent Price's favorite films because well, it's more realistic. This is a very dark film. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, you can't. I mean, and I think one of the things I like about it is, is I'm a big fan of horror that doesn't just go out there and just, well, we're going to show the blood and gore because that's what brings the movie audience yeah. in. We're not going to buy you a coffee if you die during the film. <laughs> yeah, we're one, yeah, the other thing. It, this has to do with, let's see. This let's is not, this is not a castle story. film. Let's that's tell a, the story. This is not a castle nothing, film. This yeah, is, yeah. and, and like I said, nothing, we're talking about American international release. To do this, I mean, this is a serious. I mean, this could be a serious art film. I mean, I, I could see something like this being praised by. Uh, okay, now this is artists. one of the last. This is one of the last symptoms of the the disease. The blindness. The blindness. And I guess he's kind of giving up hope right here. Well, about that's it. Here. Yeah. The and it's the he's talking about here how they're handled. Right. Well, I think that's another thing that's a little changes, uh, and this goes into modern um, 
fiction nowadays is people do think about, oh, how would the government react in a certain situation like this? And and this is just typical what would happen. You'd have, obviously, a martial law type society because, you know, it's an emergency situation. If you got an emergency situation, well, you're off for the, emergency time. That's know. the difference, too, about yeah. the why is she in a tomb? Right. And others are burnt. Right. And it's basically because he handles the death on his own. Right. If he reported it, their bodies would be taken to the pit to be burned. And my guess is see how, see, this is done. They're taken away to be burned in the pit. And see, they're taken into those big trucks. And and you can see right here, when uh, you see the daughter changing, you, you wonder how much that affected the daughter being bitten in, of course, uh, the Night of the Living Dead because, Mommy, I hurt. And it was so creepy. And, and it is just a creepy feeling knowing that you can't control, you know, someone young like that and, and stop. Uh, their departure from the uh, reality of the world of the uh, humanism and and then they're just changing to something that they can't control and that's that is a scary okay, now here here we see the final this is the final straw for Ben Ben's figured it out I was watching Ben. He he reminds me so much of a of a, a little Joe from Bonanza, and I was like, <laughs> "You can be the boss down here. I'm the boss up here." <laughs> and and you can see that. See, he's already figured out. Uh, it's vampirism, so he's got the. Uh, garlic and the mirrors long before Morgan does this. And so it's I, ironic that Ben ends up being a vampire. As we see the European police, that should have been a giveaway that this was filmed in Italy. <laughs> but we don't know. We don't know. So it's like, well, well, I mean, if you just look at the little tiny weird cars. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I mean, this sedan. I mean, that this sedan. This station wagon here looks like an American car. Yeah. But if you look at the little tiny cars, <laughs> we, don't, we didn't have a little car. The only little tiny car that we had like that would have been the VW. See, I am American. I am driving a pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> the lab sure is clean it's today. It's a Mercedes pickup truck, but it's a pickup truck. And his insistence to continue to go to work. I, you have to. It's really <laughs> tough to do uh, solo work and keep him. If you don't have somebody to talk to, it really is hard to have uh, without conflict. You just don't have much interest. And I think one thing with this film being so not watched by people, it was so easy for someone like you know the. the uh, Night of the Living Dead makers to say, hey, let's use the aspect of, let's use these rules here, you know, kind of deal. And not saying that they ripped everything off, but. <laughs> well, Romero obviously yeah. Watched organized. Film, yeah. yeah, but right. I mean, he obviously organized the zombie rules. Right. I mean, it's just like, well, it's like a lot of people adhere to, as a, as, I mean, I, yeah, Isaac Asimov's robot rules. There's three rules of robots. And uh, a lot of, uh, if you look, a lot of movies follow those rules because they make a lot of sense. And Romero, obviously, when he created uh, Night of the Living Dead and the franchise that would follow, uh, he had to have his ideas of what 
zombies were going to be like. Right. And again, I'd like to go over the Arkoff formula, which is the American International Lease, and why it's so hard to believe that this is American International Lease. The Arkoff film formula, which is, of course, American International Release, had these things, and uh, that the film had to have action, excitement, entertaining drama, revolution, novel or controversial themes and ideas, killing, a modicum of violence, oratory, notable dialogue and speeches, fantasy, acted out fantasies, common to the audience, and, of course, finally, fornication. <laughs> For young adults. Uh, this was his idea of how a film got sold. And that was uh, Arkoff, of course, of American international release fame, which would go on uh, creating some of the greatest biker flicks of all time. And like other things, uh, biker flicks to me are hit and misses. You know, you either going to have a good one, you're going to have a really, really bad one. <clears throat> And of course, just like uh, the book, this this had the same reaction as the book did. And of course, the book eventually opened up doors for Richard Matheson because I guess just like there's musicians, musicians, there's readers, uh, readers, and I think that's what he was critically receptive by the writing community, and that's all that really mattered. Because after that, it was just downhill for the guy who went on to uh, write some of the greatest TV shows of all time, some of the greatest, uh, you know, TV movies of all time. Uh, he kept on with the Ray Bradbury rules, which was write a story a week uh, rules. He was um, very, uh, to me, very influential in changing the outlines of writing, and I wish more writers would follow his outline Instead of other writers today, it really, uh, I, I'm just disappointed when I, I took writing someone, uh, I was taught more of the Richard Matheson writing style versus the uh, uh, typical outline writing. And it seems like everybody's afraid to get away from that. I mean, if you don't get away from it, it's like what, um, uh, you know, the later we'll find out is such people, Quentin Tarantino and of course, uh, Rob Rodriguez, their rules is if you want to make films like everybody else, then uh, go to, you know, film school. But if you want to make good films like no one else and be creative and original, don't go to film school. And it's the same way with writing. We get in this whole concept of writing a story a certain way that it, it takes out originality, right? Am I not correct about this? Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's art versus yeah. uh, monetary value. Right. Because can you imagine if he would have sold this I did during this time? It was like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. You know, I mean, vampire yeah. rules have already been established. And right. and a taking the supernatural out of it is just plain stupid Richard Matheson. Mm -hmm. And, of course, now it's he's influenced so many uh, movies well, see, that's, from that. Again, that's the Hollywood rules. Right. I mean, <laughs> if you actually were to follow legends of um, actual legends of vampires... Things like uh, sticking a, a a wooden stake that's about a foot long through a person, and and expecting some of the vampire strength to just sit there and let the it take over when their heart's no longer pumping blood. Uh, the the European legend of a stake through the vampire's heart was actually more like putting a pin through a butterfly. The vampire could no longer move. You pinned them to the ground, not just drove a piece of wood like there was something magical about the wood. Right. I mean, and, that's, that, that, that and, there is the scientific, that's a, a, already a scientific thing of, uh, of the legend. Um, in my opinion, what you would do is, since they had an, uh, a, uh, an allergy to sunlight, you would take and pin them to the ground outside, and when the sun rose, it would kill them. Um, but, you know, well, Hollywood did its thing. 
and it created the rules. The, the I Am Legend is, of course, referred to as the first, quote, modern vampire novel. It is a novel of a social theme that I Am Legend made a lasting impression on the cinematic zombie genre. Uh, George Romero, of course, acknowledged it as the influence of his 1964 adaption of The Last Man on Earth upon his, sim, you know, semi-annual film, Night of the Living Dead. In discussing the creation of The Night of the Living Dead, Romero remarked, I'd written a short story which I basically had ripped off from a Richard Matheson novel called I Am Legend. More of film critics noted similarities between Night of the Living Dead and the 1964 Last Man on Earth. Said books I Am Legend were an inspiration to me, and film critics noted that. This I Am Legend has also been adapted to comic books, uh, radio play. There's a nine-part abridged reading, and the novel form was in on January 2006 on the BBC. I am surprised that Vincent Price, who did a lot of BBC uh, radio work, didn't adapt that to radio as well. That would have been very, very interesting and would have been yeah, something have been. I would, wouldn't mind hearing. Um, <laughs> From another, his epic thing, voice, yeah. another thing about the post apocalyptic movies right. at this time, you'd be surprised at how many of them had to do with race. And I'm not talking about the race of humanity, but as the racial issue majority of the ones that i've talked about earlier uh the um the oh uh the ones that i talked about earlier uh which were uh, the world the flesh and the devil and five both had a racial theme to it in other words there was a character that was african-american and that theme can't, had something to do with the storyline. Uh, this movie does it different. The race is actually humanity versus something else, uh, which makes for a very different racial theme. Uh, another one, which, which uh, Romero did the same thing. Not to follow this, but to follow those other movies in that there was an African-American character and it was the treatment of that African-American character that came into play of the, uh, the, the movie. This, on the other hand, it's just all about this man being the last of his kind. And as we see here, one of the, the worst horrors that a person could imagine and is happening. And of course, this is, stays true to the novel adaptation of that and, and makes it more, uh, more but just sad and no, upon him. The, the, the facial acting of this man, you could just see exactly what was going on behind his eyes from that scene. It's just this... I mean, the man had such... Ability to play on your emotions with his just his facial expressions, um, you know that's that's not an easy thing to do. A lot of actors they they rely more on on their lines and 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 maybe body movement, but to see just despair in this man's face or even disgust for something that he had to do. That's, you know, that's, that's amazing. Um, There's also a a film called I Am Omega, which was, uh, was uh, basically more like a TV movie that was also done. I thought that, wasn't that a directed DVD? I, I, yeah, I guess so. That's what it was. Yeah, that's, it was. It was made. Yeah, it's about and the same it was time. Uh, in I'm race made. with uh, I am Legend, right. Will Smith. I Richard Matheson has not been satisfied with any of the film adaptations, and the reason is because they. I, my main reason is why in the world would they change the ending? The ending in the book is obviously very epic. It has uh, powerful gladiatorial. Uh, themes to it. I don't understand why. What's the big deal? Why they don't want to end on that note? Uh, I I just you know it really amazes me that nothing like that could be redone. I don't see what the problem is. Why they can't do 
a one that, and that's what someone had written is I'm just still waiting for the ultimate, uh, I am legend version, even though this is the closest of the, uh, of all three of what you, if you read the book, Jeez. but again, they changed the ending because He's car of, shopping right. And, and of course, <laughs> like, like we were saying earlier, he picks up a station wagon cause he has to pick up dead bodies. And like I said, he was talking about why didn't he do a truck. And I think it's to show that he is trying to hold, to the past and well it also doesn't well. fit in the garage right exactly that would be so. also too because the vampires would probably get the truck and run off with it they'd be like going down the street with the truck party and stuff and this is our first little friendly character that comes out of it and this is true to the book and i am legend also uh, the movie 2007 uh people praise uh the dog character for that and that was a good idea with will smith and it uh, really helped the film along with having the dog character in as well, yeah. See the elation in his face. I'm happy now. I got a friend. Yeah, I mean, it's just to be friend. able to interact with something living. Um, oh, forget it. <laughs> well, he knows he can't outrun the dog. <laughs> He's just too tired. I mean, there's a certain. Amount of weariness has taken its toll on him. Yeah. Well, I would have chased him down the station wagon, though. That's just me. <laughs> well, <laughs> until he got tired. <laughs> yeah, but there's then there's a uh, also a uh, problem. He may hit the dog too, because you know how dog. Oh, he's are. still looking for the dog here, yeah, is he? Yeah. And of course, well, this this, is, this is, again, this is this is very, Rome. <laughs> As you can see, no, this is this is obviously not, Detroit. <laughs> There's lots of cars around. Me. Oh no, it's it's Seattle. See the sun, the the the, the needle there. All right. It's a very short needle, but that's. <laughs> oh, dog, where are you, doggy? Omega Man is considered the more popish of the three, and and more exciting. Now, this is something very unusual. Oh, yeah, here. we find out here that he finds now we've got other killers. Yeah. But notice what they use. Yeah. Stakes. Or metal pose. Or... Yeah. So they go with the legend they're made iron. of iron. Yeah. In other words, he's all of a sudden realized that either wood doesn't have a whole lot of lasting effect. Or it's never been wood that's the the reason that. Well, also too, we may have uh, some sadists on our hands here that are holding them down until the sun rises and letting them burn. Well, that's not that's, sadism. That's uh, that's survival. <laughs> it's a war, Sean. It's but I wouldn't war. let them suffer. I, you know, I I wouldn't hold them down to the uh, suffer. I would use the wood stake to the heart, get it over quick and easy. <laughs> you know, that's just me. I'm just I've got compassion. Um, the whole well, I guess you could chop him up, chop them up. <laughs> but you know, as many people as say that that this one doesn't have the cultic feel. Uh, it really does because uh, this 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 group of people okay, that are attacking yeah. these uh, vampires are um, okay. See, he's oh he's happy. The dog has returned. Yeah, but he's hurt unfortunately mm-hmm. in the process, and and we feel a little bit of sadness for the dog. Everybody loves a dog, you know. Watching a dog suffer is just it just really breaks your heart, you know. Well, it's a detach. It's a detachment of humanity, because humans keep dogs as pets. Yeah, if it was a cat, people would be cheering right now. Not me. <laughs> Most people. <laughs> Not me. Yay! The cat's dead. <laughs> Not me. No, there is this whole thing because dog is man's best friend. You know, cats are just, if they were bigger than you, they just eat you. <laughs> dogs would do the same thing. No, they wouldn't. Dog, dog, it don't matter how big a dog is, if he likes you and you're loyal to him, you're good to him, he'll he'll love you to the day you die. 
Your cat is one of those type of people would turn you into the police. Spoken, spoken you know. as someone that owns no dogs. <laughs> of course, like you said, uh, he worked at uh, London until 1935, and a lot of people, you know, he is an American who uh, learned stage from uh, the British. And the important reason is that because uh, they had to be loud. They didn't have uh, systems like we do now. And and so when Americans went to speaking films, they said, we need someone who can speak loud enough so we can hear them because the Americans didn't have to speak in their films for the longest time. But the theater was so huge in London and they had to be really loud. That reason why we recruited so many Londoners after that, uh, you know, from uh, Vincent Price to Peter Cushion to Christopher Lee to uh, we can go on so forth and so forth as uh, we are. I was talking about Donald Pleasance as uh, we, we talk about how many roles that he is. He's passed away in 1995 as we get into the Halloween season. Uh, Christopher Lee actually uh, rejected the role of um, Dr. Loomis in Halloween and... It would have been a totally different film. But uh, Christopher Lee and Vincent Price were born on the same day, and they were really mutually good friends. And every Christmas, uh, um, uh, Christopher Lee will tell stories of uh, Vincent Price and their the friendship uh, that they had. Just and here, Here's a touch of madness here. Okay. Because he's just realized the irony. He's got a new friend, but guess what? He's sick. He's bad. Yeah. Yep. It's just irony for him. So he sticks a little put piece of wood through the through the dog and buries him. Buries him. Now, in the 1960s at this time, uh, Vincent Price is doing a lot of low budget films with AIP, which is American International. You know, he's some of his films have earned over two million dollars. House of Usher has been played. The Pit and the Penland was in '61. Uh, Tales of Terror in 62, uh, 1963 did all these films that just had low budget coming in, but high uh, outcome, just box office hits afterwards. And then and so after this one, he sort of went campy after this. Uh, the Last Man on Earth came in 64. Uh, then he kind of well, went this is, campy in 66. This is, well, this is, well, 66 is not very far from his Batman. Batman. Yeah. And this, and that's okay. where this is, this right here is a, again, a very pivotal scene in the, in the movie. And we introduce Ruth. Ruth. Yes. Tell me the truth, Ruth. Okay. Yes. Are you a vampire or not? I really, I immediately liked Ruth. The actress who plays Ruth here it really played this character really well. Well, I could see if this was done now, right now, this character would probably be younger uh, and probably be a teenager because uh, oftentimes modern age wants to use uh, teenagers to be more skeptical. And this is this is a very skeptical um character um and, and has to be um but it's it's more along the lines if anybody's ever seen the blade series it's really more along that lines um these characters or these other humanoids uh they have a fear of morgan and uh, and it's a little akin to Blade, right? And that Blade was way, the daywalker well, who. The more I compare it to is where I I study into it. I see it as Big Bigfoot, because uh, they they try to put us like that's the whole thing. It's a legend, and we think of the Bigfoot legend. Well, uh, and that's where I Blade. Why, watch the Blade movies. He's legend too. Yeah, he's legend in the fact that he'll. Kick your rear. <laughs> well, it's vampires. The vampires use him as a legend, or they they have him as a legend because only those that have actually come in contact with him. Have well, ever seen I mean, that, what I'm trying to say is, and those don't live. I see. Blade. Blade is a is a nemesis to the vampires. 
what the deal with uh, you know uh, we'll go into uh, what Ruth is of course she's the bait and is they're very skeptical that all the things they have heard about him so they they're testing the waters here uh, that's the reason why like if you get into I am legend the movie you know you'll see them progress in their style of uh, they're getting smarter as you can see but the actress who plays Ruth, uh, uh, Frances Betoya, she was born in Rome and she made her first appearance, of course, in Un Paca a la Para by Ciro Marcellini. The following year, she appeared in, of course, uh, other films. She was in Desert Warrior, and uh, until then, she had did about four films before appearing in here. Um, she was uh, she was born May of 1936. So she was probably around 28 years of age when she uh, filmed this uh, version of I Am Legend. She appeared as a nun in Apocalypse Sufima Giallo. So she was in uh, other in Giallo films as well. And she appeared in a lover's comedy in 1967 and The Seventh Four in 1967. And she married uh, Tognazi in 1972. Uh, she starred alongside Catherine Deneuve and Marcelo Mastrani and Michelle Parkelli for her last film in 1974. And in 1993 was her um, last role where she played the lead role. But uh, she, her. But he's, right now he's doing tests on yeah. Ruth to see who she actually is. Is he, in his mind, she may be someone about to become a vampire or in his mind, something that's maybe even a vampire by night, human by day. So he's got to know what he's dealing with here. Well, it makes you wonder, you know, the seriousness of this film is if this is what drove him to go to camp after <laughs> 1960. Of course, he started campy in the first place with the black and white, but, uh, you know, he's he's not, he's not taken seriously after this film, even though this is one of his favorites. Uh, he was he made lots and lots of money, was a big art collector, donated 70,000, I, I want to say 700,000, no, 70,000 portraits of art to different art museums around the world every year. Just uh, very one of, the, one of the most successful art collectors in the world, uh, Vincent Price. Did. To have that many a year is just, I cannot even fathom having that many paintings a year to even own that many. Uh, but he would donate a lot of them to uh, different charitable organizations. Uh, he's... Um, I would say he sold he sold about fifty thousand fine art prints to the general public. Uh, Nine thousand pieces has been valued to five million dollars. Uh, he bought twenty five dollars from a couple and was <laughs> it was just unbelievably good deal in uh, the art community. And uh, I myself, but as we see here, you know. This is the this is the last person. This is the first person he's seen in three years. People, uh, what we're dealing with here. Mm, what's got to be going through his mind? Uh, but it's it, there is a coldness about him though on this. Uh, with a lot of other post apocalyptic films, the first in inclination is is that this would be somebody that he needs to mate with to progress the species. But that's not what seems to be going through Morgan's mind. No, and, and that's where you, 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 what we're talking about is, you know, some people are driven more mentally and some people yeah. are drawn physically. And I think that's what Richard Matheson is. He's one of these persons who's, who is driven uh, mentally. He's not driven uh, physically. And people who are driven mentally, people will mistake them as being incapable of love. But that's because you're thinking about physical love. Uh, Morgan is the type of person he has to analyze, even though I think he's more craving 
uh, his lack of ability to analyze a person than he is uh, for uh, you know for pleasure physically. You know what I'm trying to say? Because he's he's that's his passion of well, science. It's, well, another thing you've got to understand too, he was a skeptic, right? To begin exactly. with, so he's still a skeptic. He's a skeptical scientist, right? And it's it's not that that's a bad thing. I mean, something when I, when I think of skepticism, I think. No, actually, that's what a skept, what a scientist really needs to be more skeptical than than we we get a lot of uh, scientists now that have preconceived ideas. Uh, it's like, well, it's you know to believe something just because somebody told you it's so, it really isn't science. Uh, he's a man that goes in depth to find out to prove to believe. Uh, he's got that, that kind of issue right here. He knows that he may cease to be if he's wrong about Ruth. Uh, whereas. And of course it goes to, uh, Mago man keeps this and, uh, about the cure is, is in more. Now, a mega man is more emotionally driven versus this film which is very hard to believe, but it's because you had so many movies such as Dirty Harry and different things like that were really popular films. And it was kind of like I said, I was telling you, it's kind of like the cop movie version of I Am Legend is, is Charlton S. But if someone, if you want to enjoy and have a good time and really see where, um, where the kids of today uh, of those days, enjoyed films and watching. That was that's Omega Man. Omega Man is that type of film, and there's so many good things about that film. Whereas this is uh, is one of these films. Uh, it's one of these films of the films okay, of the here's, critics. Yeah, here's the actual revelation. Here, this is when he actually feel. This is when he actually gets to realize what he's dealing with here. Yeah. So that we have a a temporary cure here, but uh, he wants to go beyond that. He wants a permanent cure. <laughs> I love this. Do you think I'm a clown? <laughs> well, that's an issue too. Me? You've got a, that's an issue too. That's that comes up all of a sudden. Is that and it's never really explained. How did these seemingly mindless creatures develop this even temporary cure? I mean, when they're walking around and about the only thing they can do is sling a club, how could they done this? Was this done as a last dish effort of somebody? Was this maybe something that Ben was working on and somebody got a hold of it right before Ben died? I think the whole thing is with that is, uh, like I said, if you uh, mean people believe that they were evolving, is that it, just like any other creature, eventually they were starting over and then they eventually would get out of it. Whether you take George Romero's, uh, not in lead of dead zombies. He gets him to be able to use weapons, to be able to talk, and different things like that. He believed that the creatures would evolve back to being humans. Um, you know, of course, I have a, I don't know, you know, that's up for debate if that actually would happen or not. But I think what we see here is... <laughs> I like his bit of humor there. <laughs> Your society sounds charming. <laughs> yeah, and that, and there you go with the cultic. That's what I'm saying. They they say Omega Man tries to started the occultic thing, but I think uh, the cult uh, thing. But I think here you see a little bit of it as well. Like we're talking about, you were saying we're, we're creating a new society. That's what the first thing that that that's what the natural 
uh, ability of man. They want to do things on their own. Oh, we're going to make it better. We're going to make life better. And uh, someone like Richard uh, Matheson's character Neville is a threat to their society. And that's that's the whole idea of the book. And he's a legend, you know, then saying if it's because it, maybe there had been rebellion in this new society and the rebellion of the society was probably influenced through the stories of Neville. And that would uh, hurt the whole society of what they are. Uh, and of course, in this, we see that he is his sentencing of being a death here is because of revenge for them, him killing their family members instead of trying to cure them. But, you know, to all fairness to him, he didn't have a cure. <laughs> so I don't see him as guilty or being the anti-hero. I see well, I him, understand. You know this, what I'm saying? This part right here, though, right. was, again, not part of the original story. Yeah. Um, but it shows the compassion of him. Well, it's it shows... I think it kind of fast forwards past what could have happened if the movie did not end like it right. did. And and the other two because we really uh, movies get to see that, that follow after this, this is what they keep in their films. This this blood transfusion they oh. keep it in their films as a homage to this. And and I guess too, a lot of people thought, hey, this is a pretty good idea. It makes scientific sense because. Uh, I don't know in some ways, but I well, he he had to know. He had to know, right? This is one of those things. This is a this is. I mean, he kept himself alive all this time. He could have risked. What have happened if his transfusion had backed up, and instead of of curing Ruth, enough of it had backed up into his own bloodstream to counteract what. He was immune to. See, this is where the disease is good because it prevents like fourteen-year-old girls from looking in the mirror all the time. But <laughs> look at you, you're beautiful. <laughs> um, a lot of people think this is a lot of it too. Is this is where you keep in the 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 Omega Man feel? Is uh, this religious uh, homage here and? Then you have uh, Omega Man takes it to next extreme, but you gotta understand. I mean, there's uh, the seventies and the late sixties. You had Jesus Christ Superstar and films like that were very popular, and uh, so you know a lot of this is maybe this is the Italian way of thinking too. That's another thing to keep in mind too. Is uh, um, a lot of this stuff. I mean, they're supernatural. Uh, stories that are told in Eastern Europe is just uh, is more uh, reality to them. Uh, like uh, you know, listening to the Polish or the German version or the uh, of uh, Lilith and all those things are are scarier to me because they take them things more um, to heart than we do. Because I don't think we've ever, we we've experienced those those stories of where the gypsies got those stories and things like that, you know, uh, over here, they're just stories. And because we don't understand the culture, it's not scary to us. <laughs> you know, what's scary to us is a deer running out in front of a car or, or, <laughs> or gangs and things like that. Uh, a lawless society that we were dealing with growing up over here. Humans were more scary stories that gypsy told us, just didn't frighten us, you know, because yeah, we, of we've, we've that. essentially lost a lot of superstition uh, in yeah. this country. Um, one of the things too that that got me about this film, especially when I watched it for the first time, was technically I didn't understand the ending, and I'm not right. saying that I didn't understand what was going on. I could not feel the way that the mutants which was what they would be called i, I believe in omega man yeah. uh, the mutants would uh ha felt about him because in, in my mind oh he looks just like us he's yeah he but he's not going to harm us but their immediate reaction is is because he had harmed their, or he had destroyed yeah, families vampires or, other, yeah. or family members 
they felt that he had become a monster. Right. He, he was, and this is really not the case. And, and now we if see Ruth, Ruth has been trying, able to... Now yes. Ruth is trying to tell them right. that... But it was to know He's that. okay. Right. That there's nothing... He's he's a nice guy. Yeah. He, basically. He actually wants to see them better. Yeah. And... And it's kind of basic, like I said, we have this new order coming in, and then we'll see the hypocrisy of the new order. Yeah. You know, we're, we're oh, shall you for killing other people. We're killing these guys. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, and I think it's and a again, jab this, at is them. Not, this is not this is not how the the book ended. No, um, it was more on a society. So this is more chaotic. Yeah, this is more almost. Um, yeah, well, I mean, mobocracy. Right, and and this is the thing where you might have the Italian uh, mentality mentality here because you had so many taking down of governments like the Spanish Civil War, which is across the country. There were so many things like that. This is how governments were overthrown. And if you want to say, well, Richard Matheson is one form of government and they're, they're their new society, you know, and he's a threat to their new society that they want to create. And I think that's, to me, that's an Italian frame as we see little Joe come down there and gets killed. And I love you, Ben Cartwright. Um, oh, the light. He's cool. Leave him alone. I, I wonder if age gap was another thing they were thinking about because as we see, Ruth is obviously younger. The new society is obviously younger. And he's an older man. And I wonder if that's another uh, thing they were going for as well in the movie. I, I One commentary I heard is uh, they'll, they'll, he kind of makes it look like the idea is that all through this we're following him as the villain. I don't buy that. I don't think that at, at all. I think that we're seeing um, uh, a person who just has accidentally fell into something that he didn't mean to be into. You know what I'm saying? It's a survival mode. Right. I it's mean, not like he had control yeah, it's like over it, it, what was going on. What would you do if you were him? Right. Well, you'd do exactly like he did. Right. So Would I, I you don't, survive as exactly, long as I don't, he did? I don't see Maybe the, not. The viewpoint Would you survive of, longer than he did? Of Neville being the villain. There is, no, no he's, he's, he's doing what any normal no, person just, would do. Yeah, I was going to say, it's about, like I said, it's about the survival of this man, not necessarily a race. The race is gone. Okay? What, it, I mean, you know, the, the movie doesn't give us the option of, is there any more humans? It doesn't give us that option. That option is taken off the table. And instead, what we have a is a movie armory. about the survival of one man. Very small armory. <laughs> Again, showing that this was filmed in Italy. <laughs> it was American armory. It would be so filled with stuff, it would be funny. <laughs> yeah. It'd be like, oh my goodness. It'd be like the scene from The Matrix, you know. Mm-hmm. I think he does a very good job of of keeping them at bay, if yeah. you look at I, it. I think the idea of him being, you know, where the next scene comes from is to give a little bit towards the book's ending. Because the, the book ending is more persecution, more feeling, more, like I said, gladiatorial, Rome mm-hmm. days. And I don't know, maybe that would have been an issue as well. It's kind of like, are you digging part of the past of Rome that we don't want to talk about? <laughs> you know, the Colosseum feel. Uh, so they say, okay, in some ways we'll try to keep that by filming this last scene right here. Typical British reaction, throw dynamite at it. <laughs> it's anything right now to slow them down. That's, yeah. I mean... I don't know if he's trying to get enough opportunity to be able to talk to them. Don't know. We just, we don't get I that. I like the fact that Vincent Price gets the last word, you know, before mm-hmm. he passes away. But, of course, this scene is, I think, is the idea is to kind of say, maybe we won't do this Coliseum film feel to it, but we'll have this to kind of pay tribute to the ending of your book, Richard Madison, and by having him... Uh, have this final face off at the church. 
And this this something that it too that that you'd be surprised at how many films, uh, post apocalyptic films that I had watched that were made around this era, take as the last um, scene the um, uh, a, a connection with God. Now, as you see, all these other people that are coming to see. Uh, the whole idea, I believe, is behind this is to see, hey, this guy does really exist, as you can see. Because uh, it is kind of weird. Hey, let's bring the kids to see us kill this guy. And But it's the idea is the fact is the show that that he isn't a legend, that he is real. And, of course, we see the final ending right here of the film coming to close here. And I and I wanted, like I said, I I wondered if the directors or any of them had in mind that there was sort of this generation gap as well that we have a new society getting rid of the old society as well. And he says, "I got the last word, ha! <laughs> yeah, freaks." <laughs> And the film comes to conclusion here. Um, after this, uh, he will go on to make uh, <laughs> several campy colored films. Of my favorite of his macabre will be, of course, his, uh, the Doctor films, which I really enjoyed, um, that I have shared with people. Um, he uh, eventually went to and two years later would be on played the part of the eccentric article, uh, artist in the dancing of the day he was a favorite villain in the series as, as the antidote for the set of the Batman as throwing eggs on series stars <laughs> And thank you very much for enjoying this commentary. Leave your comments below of our commentary. Have a good evening, folks. <laughs>